Hey Spuddies, Potato McWhiskey here and today we're going to be talking about Governors in Gathering Storm, their new abilities and some strategies you can use in your games. I just want to thank Firaxis for giving me access to the press preview build of the game so that I can bring this kind of content to you guys. Uh, to start with, we're going to go through all of the Governors, talk briefly about how powerful I think all of their individual abilities are and whether they combo well together. Uh, rather than talking about how their abilities have changed, I'm just going to talk about, about what they are now. Uh, please keep in mind that this is pre-release footage and so some or all of these things could change upon or after the launch of the game. And we'll start from left to right. We'll start with Victor. So his <clears throat> first Governor ability, his innate governor ability is that he increases the city garrison combat strength by plus five and he establishes in three turns this is a pretty reasonably good ability it's not going to be hugely impactful but it is a nice little defensive <clears throat> it is a nice little defensive bonus i can't remember if this applies to the ranged combat strength of the city um, if it does it's a little bit better overall i would rate this as a as a fairly kind of weak opener bonus really what you're getting him for is that establishes in three turns and some of his follow-up abilities so the first follow-up ability that we'll talk about is a garrison commander units defending within the city's territory get plus four combat strength and your other cities within nine tiles gain plus four loyalty per turn towards their civilization so it's important to remember that this is units defending within the city's territory get plus five combat strength i can only assume that that means they do not get the uh, plus five combat strength on the offense that will require me to actually test that i haven't tested this this is just me kind of opening up the game and and, and checking these things out um the really cool thing is that the plus four loyalty per turn towards your civilization is is quite good actually um this is going to make magnus well he already was a really good sort of governor to take when you're going on a conquest um sort of of play where you're um attacking another civilization and you need governors to maintain the loyalty alongside policy cards and garrisoning units and all that sort of stuff so this is going to help you uh maintain loyalty on the offense and it's also going to help you maintain defense. Although typically, if you're getting value from the loyalty, you won't be getting value from the unit's defending uh, bonus. I would say this is a reasonably good ability. Uh, certainly makes me consider putting two governor uh, titles into M uh, Magnus or Victor when I'm going for uh, any sort of domination victory. The other uh, tier one ability that victor has is defense logistics the city cannot be put under siege accumulating strategic resources in the city gain an additional plus one per turn this is also actually a very useful ability um, the city cannot be put under siege thing isn't really super relevant against the ai it could be more relevant against players uh probably not though um but the 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 real meat here is the accumulating strategic resources gain an additional plus one per turn. Uh, strategic resources are actually really, really important for your military in Gathering Storm. And being able to get more of a strategic resource is quite useful. Uh, as well as you can actually sell your strategic resources in sort of chunks to the AI. So this could be a way for you to um, earn money by selling the uh, strategics to the ai so that's actually it's quite a quite a flexible bonus and it, it it is is quite good i don't know if i would call it um really really good but i think you can certainly find a way to get value out of this <clears throat> whether you're going on the offense or if you just want to play a defensive uh, embrasure city gains we'll talk about the tier 2 ability now this is embrasure the city gains an additional range strike per turn military units trained the city start with a free promotion that do not already start with a free promotion um so the extra ranged attack on the city is pretty reasonable i think it could be worth making a city that's on the border with an enemy that is sort of geared around military production and you could use uh victor uh since this ability combos quite well with um you know sort of having a border city that's providing loyalty to all your other border cities and uh, the free promotion is actually quite powerful it essentially means that your units are either starting with a combat bonus in the bank or with a, a, a 50 health heal in the bank the moment they're created now the downside is that you know you won't have the opportunity to earn experience if you're holding on to that promotion but that's a that's a it's a i would say this is a reasonably good one uh you could certainly pick this up if you're going for some sort of domination strategy um the the big problem i have with this <clears throat> is that it doesn't really um one of the one of the more things that you're going to want to do with victor is if you're using him in a domination game right you're going to want to be moving him around a lot um, and this ability kind of is telling you to keep him 
in a city with a really good production line that's producing units. So there's a little bit of a push-pull mechanic here that's kind of making it difficult to really get value out of this if you're trying to get value out of this. Um, definitely, I think these two combo well together really well, whereas the garrison commander is more of something you just put, just invest into the garrison commander and then leave it at that. So I kind of want you to imagine um, when you're deciding to invest governor titles into into Victor, it's about whether or not you want to go, um, you want to put an uh, put two governor titles into him, or if you want to put three. And imagine this left side tree is where you put the two, and this right side is where you put the three. So just to, just kind of imagine that this doesn't actually connect to Embrasure, because if you're getting value out of Garrison Commander, you're going to have a very hard time getting value out of Embrasure. Now, I mean, sure, you could probably move him around and get a little bit of value out of him because he establishes quite quickly, but still, the point stands that I think these are a little bit counter-synergistic, whereas these kind of work well together because you might want to find a city that has strategic resources, which typically have quite good production on them, and then Embrasure will allow you to use those strategic resources to produce units that are slightly better because they start with an extra promotion. It's important to remember that this free promotion, uh, the way this is worded, is that it's telling me that it only applies to units that don't already start with a free promotion. So if you have some sort of sort of other bonus or you have a particular unit that you train that starts with a free promotion, you're not going to get extra value out of that. Air defense initiative. Uh, air units, I think, are still not in an amazing place. And I think a uh, boost to anti-air support units is just, eh. It's not really going to make a huge difference to the game, I don't think. Arms race proponent, on the other hand, um, the sort of... This is considered like an extension of this right hand three, tree. So if you want to go a four drop and you want to start using nukes, uh, remember that there is a whole nother era in the game now. And uh, it takes a little bit longer to win a game in Civilization VI nowadays uh, in the Gathering Storm expansion with the extension of that last era. So that means you're going to have more opportunities to actually use nukes and make them matter. So getting a 30% production to all nuclear armament projects in the city uh, could be quite useful as a way to sort of transition out of producing military with embrasure and then start doing this, especially since you'll still be getting the extra strategics if you go down this right-hand tree. So I think uh, in terms of synergy, I think these two work well quite together and then this sort of uh, right-hand tree works well together and then you can transition into arms race. Um, I would probably... Um, I don't know if I would really invest all that much into Victor in most of my games. I would probably put maybe two points into him in a domination game and use him to push around. Uh, defense logistics and embrasure can be quite handy, but I don't know if it would be worth it, when you, especially when you start to consider some of the other opportunities that other governors provide you. Now let's talk about Amani. So Amani is... Uh, has some small changes, but I still think she is quite good. Uh, I definitely think I undervalue Amani, uh, simply because I kind of value other abilities quite a lot. But Amani is still really, really good. And I think she's going to be um, very valuable if you want to invest into her. <clears throat> so her first av ability is that she can be assigned to a city-state where she acts as two envoys. Uh, this ability is quite useful. Uh, especially in the very early game, because if you meet a city-state first and then get a Mani, you can put a Mani in that city-state and then immediately get the Suzerain bonus. And if the Suzerain bonus is particularly good, you can get a lot of value out of that um, because that'll bring you up to three and you need a minimum of three to become the Suzerain. Of course, you might be outcompeted by the AI for that Suzerain bonus, so don't rely on it. But this is actually quite powerful because uh, being Suzerain of a city-state now also gives you plus one diplomatic uh Di diplomacy point i can't remember what they're called hold on let me look it up right here in a second let me just double check it what does it say up here uh diplomatic favor being, being the being the suzerain of a city state gives you plus one diplomatic favor per turn i think as a base so this could be a reasonably powerful ability she also has emissary which is your other cities within nine tiles and not owned by you lose two loyalty per turn uh, i think it's a little bit weak it is Two loyalty really isn't a huge amount. It could be sort of the tipping point to push a city into disloyalty. Um, but if you're relying on a two loyalty... Uh, so it, it, the, the, the kind of weakness of this is um, if you're relying on two loyalty to make a city go negative into the loyalty, that city is only going to be ticking down between, you know, z w like zero and 1.9 loyalty per turn. Where this will be most applicable is if a city is ticking down by, you know, maybe somewhere between one and five points and you need to speed up its loyalty tick down a little bit quicker then you could probably get some value out of this but i think um you know it, it kind of it, the, the problem with this ability is it doesn't help you if the city has excess loyalty and it doesn't really help you that much if it has massively negative loyalty because it doesn't really speed it up all that much 
Her, sec her other tier one ability is Affluence. While she's established in a city-state, provide a copy of its luxury resources to you. This is actually quite good, particularly if you can manage to find a city-state that has maybe one or two luxuries that you maybe don't have access to in your, um, in your, in your own empire. So this can be quite helpful, quite useful. I would imagine um, it's not the most powerful thing but the nice thing is that it feeds into foreign investor which we'll talk about here in a, uh, i guess we'll talk about it now uh, foreign investor while established in a city state accumulates its strategic resources when suzerain received double the amount of accumulated strategic resources this is actually quite an interesting ability because uh if there's a strategic resource that you don't have access to and you're not really in a position to conquer that particular city state establishing a money in that city state could give you access to that strategic resource and maybe get you a few uh units that rely on that strategic resource so it's quite useful i would say um certainly not an amazing ability but it's just another way for you to maybe circumvent um a lack of a strategic um being the suzerain doubling it is quite helpful too um so you know i would say this is certainly worth considering going down to here if you really really need the access to the strategic resource in combination with magnus later i'll talk a little bit about his abilities and how these can actually work quite well together uh enemy spies operate at three levels below the normal in the city this is the local informants um not really too much to say about this if you have a if you have a spaceport this could be quite useful to make it so that your spaceport can't get pillaged it's really not that great it's kind of just okay i have noticed i have played a couple of games in gathering storm and the ai is much more active about using spies to disrupt your uh, territory uh, a lot of stuff like um pillaging dams and all that sort of stuff and eliminating governors so maybe getting local informants could actually be quite useful uh, particularly if you're going for a scientific victory but usually if you're going for a scientific victory you want another governor established in your spaceport and just use spies to defend so that you can get value out of stuff like the extra spaceport product productivity but if you're really really confident that you can win a space uh, race victory without the production bonus and you're more interested in just preventing the pillaging of your spaceport local informants can be quite a valuable um can be quite a valuable governor promotion and then she also has puppeteer while established in the city state double the number of envoys you have here uh in my opinion this left hand tree is more of uh if you want to establish amani in your own territory which i do not think is the most powerful way to use her i think this is certainly this left hand side here is the weakest part of her tree and i think this right hand side is quite powerful <clears throat> relative to this i think this is certainly um the sort of line you're going to want to go down to uh you could easily go you know put put two to three points into amani i think she's certainly worth investing one point into her early uh if it's part of your strategy to get a hold of a, an early city state to gain a, a bonus or a suzerainty bonus and then sort of follow up and get extra value out of that with some more governor titles and then go for puppeteer if you really want to guarantee that you kind of hold on to the suzerainty of that city state so i would say amani is reasonably powerful i think she has some interesting abilities and um, now we'll move on and talk about moksha who i think is one of my new favorite governors in the gathering storm expansion so his base ability is religious pressure to adjacent cities is 100 stronger from the city this is a reasonably good bonus if you're going for an early religion because it means i think whole i think um, holy cities generate eight pressure per turn base and getting the 100% stronger pressure means it'll go up to 16 pressure per turn base. Now consider that a, a missionary generates like 200 um, religious pressure base and he does also erode pressure by 10% when he uh, uses his charge. But getting that means uh, over the course of like tw 13 turns, 13 to 14 turns, you're essentially getting a free missionary charge in all of the cities near your your. Uh, holy city so this can be quite powerful think of this as a way to generate uh, to generate religious pressure uh so essentially out of nothing without having to spend the faith on missionaries so this is this is quite a powerful ability for spreading your religion early in the game if you go for an early religion uh grand inquisitor plus 10 religious combat strength in the theological combat and toss of the city not really great i wouldn't recommend this one uh laying on of hands all governor's units heal fully in one turn of tiles in the city i'm really not sure what this means all governor's units um i'm going to assume that this means if you have just military or religious units inside the city they will heal up um which seems like it could be reasonably powerful you know you park him on the edge of a you know civilization you're trying to convert religiously and you know if you get into a bit of theological combat you can bring your guys back and heal them up anywhere not having to park them beside the holy site so this is reasonably okay uh, then they also have citadel of god this is their tier two ability the city ignores religious pressures from religions not founded by the governor's player eh not really super relevant 
is mildly helpful. However, the second half of this is gain faith equal to 25% of the construction cost when finishing buildings. This is actually reasonably good. Um, you're going to want to move him around and try to get some value out of this, uh, timing really high cost buildings to be finished here. The real sort of meat of this character, though, is when you invest heavily into him when you're going for a religious victory or for uh, a heavy faith generation game. So Patron Saint is his tier three ability. It is his first tier three ability. It gives apostles and warrior monks trained in the city receive one extra promotion when receiving their first promotion. This is actually really, really powerful, particularly um, if you're trying to get value out of warrior monks. Warrior monks can... Uh, get a lot of combat bonuses so getting an extra promotion is actually quite good here i really do want to do a religious conquest game where i go for warrior monks i've just never really gotten around to it it's, it's one of those things that i just never did um and obviously apostles getting an extra uh promotion is really really powerful if you're going for any sort of religion game because you can get really really powerful combos like triple spread pressure and elimination uh, and then eliminate enemy pressure so you can instantane you can essentially use a single apostle charge to fully convert a city really 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 powerful ability when you're going for a religious game uh clearly like he's obviously the tier one uh governor when going for a religion game and divine architect i find is extremely powerful um because being able to purchase districts with faith means that faith which is already a really powerful um yield in the game in my opinion um, because of its flexibility and the amount of things that you can do with it it means that you're just going to get that much more out of it and i'm pretty sure that even if you purchase um if you purchase a district with faith you'll get a a small faith refund from citadel of god this is a really powerful ability if you go for an early religion and then focus on faith generation because you'll be able to move moksha around and sort of purchase districts because remember a lot of your cities aren't going to get all access like aren't going to sort of unlock their latest district all at the same time so you can kind of be like okay i know that you know city a is going to be unlocking a new district in 20 in in in, in six turns so next turn i'm going to move moksha over there i'm going to purchase a district and then i know city b is unlocking a new district in like 11 turns so i'm going to move moksha over there and then purchase a district there and so it's really just a way for you to convert your faith into production which is really really powerful which is a really powerful thing to do because um converting faith into production uh, it, it essentially production is production can be a, a difficult thing to come by sometimes and having moksha essentially generate production from faith is really really powerful uh, so i think this is essentially um an ignorable pr uh, promotion i definitely think um if you're going to invest into moksha you're going to want to go all the way down so i think moksha kind of strikes me as a governor that you might put like one point into early to get the extra religious pressure and then invest heavily depending on whether or not you just want to go for a faith gener a faith generation strategy that you can convert into production or if you want to go for a full religious victory you go down to patron state so i feel like he's a he's a governor that you want to invest into heavily to get value out of or just put a one point in him and sort of let him act as a way to generate loyalty and a way to generate religious pressure I, I really like Moksha in the expansion. I think he's really, really great. And I think he has a lot of potential to um, <clears throat> to make um, to make the game more fun. Because he can move him around and buy, buy districts. Sort of like Reyna. We'll talk about Reyna when we get to her. Magnus, as always, is plus 50% yields from plot harvests and feature removals in the city. Uh, some things to note. Um, chopping has been sort of uh, indirectly nerfed in... Well, I, well probably probably more accurate to say it's directly nerfed but basically chopping all the forests in your empire has some serious consequences now uh for example things like droughts can appear uh which can damage your tiles and lower their food their their food output uh additionally um with the global warming mechanic the more forests and stuff that you chop from the map the more significant and powerful the sort of global warming effects will be with the rising sea levels and all that sort of stuff so uh sort of an indirect nerf to magnus i still think this is a really strong ability and certainly worth dropping a single point into to get value from this um let's talk about his tier one ability surplus logistics plus 20 percent growth in this city your trade routes ending here provide plus two food to their starting city i still feel like this is not a very good uh promotion because the sort of uh counter synergy between his two between his base uh, ability and this ability mean that you're going to want to be moving him around to get value from chopping uh, in different cities and then surplus logistics is really asking you to sit him to sort of sit here uh, in a single place providing a lot of food to your empire I think surplus logistics is a really powerful ability the problem is that food just isn't really that good in civilization 6 uh, compared to previous civilization games um, you know growth 
is sort of a lot lower on my sort of uh, wish list when I'm thinking about what sort of yields I want in a city. I generally speak and I want production and then base and um, basically I want just enough growth to grow the city to its housing limit and then I want production and then any other yield is pretty much the order. Um, and then like the second I have enough growth to get my city to its housing limit, I pretty much don't care about food anymore. <clears throat> Uh, provision is his other tier tier one ability uh provision uh settlers train the city do not consume a population this can actually be quite powerful if you have a high production city like your capital in the early game and you want to pump out a lot of settlers this will mean that you don't lose that little bit of production every time you produce a settler uh so this is quite a quite a good ability um i i definitely think of the two here provision is better then you have his tier two abilities we'll talk about black marketer first because i think this is the uh because this is the stronger side, I think this is a stronger follow-up as well. Strategic resources for units are discounted at 80%. So I did kind of reference that Amani and Magnus can work quite well together in the mid-game because she can get you access to strategic resources that you might not have in your lands, and then Magnus can make the your use of those strategic resources more efficient. I definitely think an 80% discount is a lot, so uh, I can't actually look up the Civipedia because I'm not allowed to. But I can quickly show you, for example, a swordsman here costs 20 iron. Getting an 80% discount here means that brings you down to 4 iron. 4 iron is easily doable if you, you know, you could pump out swordsman all day long uh, if you have a mani established in another city. Now, probably a more applicable unit would be like the knight, because this is about the time that that, com that a mani, um, that a mani magnus combo is going to come out. Stuff like, um, you know, knights or, well, Muscomen, Janissaries for the Ottomans. I did pick the Ottomans to sort of show you. So that could mean that you can essentially sort of convert your strategic resources that you're... And remember, this works on its own as well. But in particular, if you, if you lack a strategic resource and need to get access to it through a money, uh, this ability on Magnus can make your strategic resources go a lot longer uh, because you, you obviously you don't have a lot of them, so you need to get value out of them. Um, this essentially means... In terms of strategic resource costs, you can produce five units for every uh, one that a normal civilization would be able to produce with the Black Market of Promotion. Um, this is quite good because, remember, strategic resources can now be sold to the AI, so you can get extra value out of it and all that sort of stuff. So it's sort of a, sort of a nice little boost here. Uh, Industrialist increases the power provided by each resource in the coal power plant, oil power plant, and nuclear power plant by one, and plus two production. So, uh, I, again, I can't really show you uh, exactly these things in the Civipedia, but I can just kind of briefly talk about them in the tech tree here. So, if you look here, the coal power plant automatically converts any amount of coal into power for cities within six tiles that need it each turn at the rate of one uh, coal to four power. Uh, coal is extremely polluting. I played a game where I focused heavily on getting a lot of powered buildings, and um, the sea levels rose really fast. <laughs> I was... I pretty much coated the world in cold, coal dust and it was not happy with me. There was droughts, there was uh, all sorts of crazy stuff with storms and blizzards and everything was happening because I went for the coal power plant strategy. Having an extra power, so what this would do is it would give this building plus two production and plus one power per coal. So let's say I need 20, uh, let's say I need 20 coal. Um, that, or uh, that, let's say I need 20 power in the surrounding cities. That means I would need to be burning four, uh, five coal per turn. Uh, if I had Magnus established with this ability, I would get plus two production and then I would have to burn one less coal, which might not seem like much, but because of how polluting coal is, that can actually make a significant difference. There are future buildings like the oil power plant, which is one oil to four power. Similar sort of problem, just makes your thingy a little bit more efficient. And getting the plus two production is also really, really nice uh, for the oil power plant because it's a plus three production. It would bring it up to plus five, which means you're getting an extra five production in all cities within six turns. And then obviously there is the nuclear power plant, which uh, is clearly more efficient. So that plus one power really doesn't make a huge difference. Of course, the, the big downside that they've talked about the nuclear power plant is that it can malfunction and you might have to keep maintaining it. Um, so yeah, uh, I think it's quite useful for trying to keep your carbon emissions down in the early game if you're building powered buildings around a sort of city. Uh, but I don't think this is going to be a super powerful promotion. I definitely think this is the weakest side. I definitely think this is the strongest side. And I still think vertical integration is pretty crap. Although, um, in Gathering Storm, 
uh, there's kind of a few more incentives to maybe build a few more industrial zones. So w with the whole power mechanic. So I definitely think that vertical integration is better than it was in Rise and Fall. But I definitely think um, the level of value you get into it, get out of it, is not really that big. It's not really that big. I definitely think Magnus is sort of all about this promo this uh, ability right here, his innate promotion, his innate ability. I definitely think this is quite good, and I definitely think this is quite good. And then these are kind of situate. This is kind of situationally if you just want to be uh, environmental. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't particularly think these are very, very good. But uh, well, actually, I, I tell a lie. These are actually really, really good if you don't want to move Magnus around to chop. Um. For example, if you're the Maori, that could be very, very good. These can be really, really powerful as the Maori, for example. But I th definitely think in a sort of more general case, provision and black marketer and the base thing are going to be way more useful because you, you can move him around in the early game, chop out settlers without losing population, and then transition him into a city with an encampment where you want to produce uh, units at a discount and stuff like that. So I, th I think Magnus is still still kind of his old self, still, still, still who he was in Rise and Fall and still quite powerful. But I definitely think with a lot of the changes to other um, governors and a lot of the changes to um, how chopping will interact with the whole global, global warming mechanic, he's a little bit weaker. I think he's definitely a more interesting governor in this expansion with the changes to his ability uh, industrialist here because it's, you know, the whole, like, it, like, once you play a game, I'm telling you, you're going to notice like you're like wow i really wish my power plants were more efficient because i'm burning so much coal uh that's actually something i didn't mention as well being able to produce more power per resource means you're going to be using less of that resource that's quite useful too and the extra production is always nice let's talk about liang the other governor that i think has received some really big buffs um in this expansion so liang's base ability is that all builders trained in the city gain plus one build charge really really nice uh, innate ability you can just put one point into her and then get more efficient builder production um before you have the plus two builder production card she essentially gives you an extra uh 33 more value from your builders after that it's a little bit less um it's more like a 20 percent value but still all things told if you're building builders um from liang city and there's a lot of really nice combos with liang like for example if you get the monumentality golden age um with a lot of faith generation you can get extra builders from your faith bought builders so you know Really, 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 really nice. Really, really nice bonus here. Uh, I, I, like, I think it's just a really strong base bonus. We'll talk about Zoning Commissioner, which is her tier 1 ability. Her first tier 1 ability. Uh, plus 20% production towards constructing districts in the city. That's actually quite good. Um, I'm not sold on it being super duper amazing. I think it's reasonably good. So, again, another little bit of a push-pull mechanic here. Where you want to be building builders. But this wants you to be building d uh, districts. So it's kind of like, eh. Uh, although an interesting combo, um, well, no, that's not really an interesting combo because you'd rather use Magnus for chopping. I was going to say that an interesting combo would be to build a builder with an extra build charge and then chop out a district and get the 20% production, but you would much rather just use Magnus and get the 50% production bonus. So, uh, a little bit of a weak ability here. I think I'd maybe like to see a second effect on here. Uh, you know what would, you know what would make Liang actually, we would make this ability, like, super duper top tier would be um districts placed on a feature harvest that feature if that's what zoning commissioner was if zoning commissioner had a secondary ability uh districts placed upon features harvest those feature features for their yields so you could plop a district down on a forest and it instantaneously chops it that would make zoning commissioner i think um probably one of the best promotions in the game i would certainly make liang well probably not one of the best but it would make liang really really interesting and really really unique in terms of her interactions with city district placement uh reinforced materials we'll talk about her tier two ability over here on the left because i definitely think this is her weakest tree the city's improvement buildings and districts can't be damaged by environmental effects i think the, the big problem with this is it's quite useful but it's also random all these environmental effects are very very random whether or not they actually happen so i think she can be valuable because sometimes you find yourself in a position where you actually can't build a dam on a on a river uh, floodplain, and so you might want to have reinforced materials to prevent any of the negative effects from environmental flooding, which can happen uh, and, and be quite devastating to your economy. Uh, so this is where that could be most useful. The problem with this is that they, you know, you can mitigate a lot of these effects, and they don't happen all that often. So eh, it's it's tornadoes can be pretty painful. I had a few tornadoes rip through my empire. Um, in one of my games and let's just say they don't just pillage like tiles they rip them up 
and they just completely rip out all of the improvements and, all, and rip up all the diff districts. They don't destroy the districts completely, but they do a lot of damage. So watch out for tornadoes, and this could be a pretty nice way to mitigate the uh, power of tornadoes. The problem is you kind of almost have to predict a random event, which you can't. You can't predict where the tornado or whatever is going to happen. So this is mostly going to be useful for preventing damage from river floods in the early game before you can get dams, I think. Uh, aquaculture. Uh, this is what I think is her sort of strongest promotion now. Um, I thought this was a very, very weak promotion, and now I think it's a very, very good promotion. So you can, just, can construct the fishery improvement. It's plus one food and plus one food if it's adjacent to a sea resource. And then fisheries provide plus one production if Liang is in the city. So this is certainly, I think Liang is, if you get a coastal city with a decent amount of water, you're going to want to invest two points into Liang and just park her there for the rest of the game. And basically use that city to produce builders and uh, just kind of fill up the um, coast with fisheries and stuff like that, which are going to be really, really valuable. Although you might want to rip up some of that stuff for some of the late game water improvements that we might talk about in another time. There's some really, really cool water improvements uh, in the expansion. So waterworks plus two housing for every neighborhood. So I think this is definitely a tier, like a tier one ability. Certainly, I think if you're going to invest into Liang, uh, put her in a coastal city and get a get a second point into aquaculture. Right? It's just it's just worth it. Um, it's a way for you to generate extra food and production. And uh, if you can get a decent amount of housing, waterworks, by the way, kind of feeds into getting extra housing. Hint, hint. Um, you can get a neighborhood, maybe get an early aqueduct and aquaculture plus waterworks will let you get a really, really large city that has a lot of production and growth and, and population and all that good stuff. Um, that's quite powerful. I think Liang, I think these three are quite, quite powerful. I think parks and recreation are okay. They're not amazing. They do the job. Um, and they provide a little bit of appeal. I think I think Liang is really about these three abilities this time. And sometimes you want to get reinforced materials if you have a city that you won't be able to prevent flooding in. Uh, so I definitely think aquaculture is her most powerful ability. And then sometimes you might be able to get value. If you can get an early aqueduct in your coastal city that you have Liang established in, uh, going the second point in waterworks is certainly going to be worth it. And I think parks and recreation is sometimes worth it in a tourism game. But yeah, it's the, the problem is, um, the problem with water, uh, the parks and recreation is that if you're using Liang to get value out of these two abilities, you're going to want to park Liang in a coastal city. Um, to get the bonuses from aquaculture and waterworks. But then when you want to build parks and recreation, you want to be moving her around your empire to build parks. And that just doesn't really work well. And then I just don't think these two uh, abilities are really, really good enough to be worth then finishing it off with parks and rec. So I think, I think this is just a little bit of a dead tree here on the left and to the bottom, where I definitely think these three are the most powerful abilities. The plus one build charge, the fishery improvement, and the housing from neighborhoods and aqueducts. Also, plus one amenity for every canal and dam district in the, in the city is quite good too. Really, 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 really good potential if you have uh, the land that supports it land and water that supports it to make Liang uh, build a city that has incredible housing, amenity, growth and food. Really, really powerful governor. Really looking forward to using her in my games and she's really, really fun to use in the games that I've already played with her. Now we move on to Pingala, who before I show you his abilities, he is easily uh, currently my tier one my tier one governor in, in Gathering Storm. And we'll talk a little bit about why. So his base ability is plus 15% science and culture generated in the city. Really, really good for an investment of one point. Really, really powerful one point investment. Uh, his other abilities are, these are just so good. I'm going to talk about these together because I really don't think you should get one or the other. Although there are situations where you might get one or the other. Plus one culture per turn for each citizen in the city. And plus one science per turn for each citizen in the city. So early game. This is going to be so incredibly powerful. Um, you can, uh, pretty much in the classical era, uh, classical era, you can have three, you can have three governor titles, right? But by the time you hit classical, right, you build your governor, so you get, well, you can have four, right? You can have four points. But I'm really going to talk about the first three. So your first three titles you can have by classical era. And if you have like a pop, uh, six to eight city that's six to eight culture and science in that city if you just park pingala there plus the 15 percent increase this guy is going to be an absolute monster monster for generating science and culture in the early game uh if you're not going for early campuses or theater squares really really powerful i cannot overstate how powerful these abilities are um because these are just absolute god tier um being able to generate that much science and culture is actually going to open up a lot of strategies in the game that 
um, I want to talk about later. But just 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 know that like if you're ever in doubt about which governor to get, just get Pingala, put two points into him, maybe a third, or get Pingala, put an extra two governor titles into him, and then just park him in your your biggest city and just forget about him because he's gonna make so much science and culture for you throughout the game. Really, really powerful governor. I really love this ability set. It makes him so interesting to use and makes uh, it really really opens up a lot of strategies that I will again talk about later. Grants uh, plus one hundred percent great people points generated per turn in the city works really really well, especially since uh, you're going to want to be growing a city quite big with Pingala in it with the culture and science, uh, getting the extra great people points. Is quite nice because you're going to want to be building a lot of districts with that really well-grown city and getting extra great people points is quite valuable <clears throat> really really good combo with the uh oracle means you can get an absolute insane insane amount of great people points because uh districts provide uh plus two great person points of their type with the oracle really really powerful pingala is probably my new favorite governor perhaps really really cr crazy strong crazy strong and i love him and i think he's wonderful um then the tier three ability here is curator uh plus 100 tourism great works of art music and writing in the city quite a nice uh thing it's pretty much pingal uh reina's old promotion since she has been changed a little bit i like this being on pingala because it means he is definitely now themed as a uh governor who is built for either going for um either going for a science victory with the space, in space initiative that we'll talk about in a moment or a culture victory with the curator and it's sort of all, all of these abilities kind of feed him into being powerful for both of those that's quite nice but then just in general you can also just put uh you can kind of invest this level and use him as a way to generate extra science and culture and then you can start thinking about investing into him more and going either tourism or science based with him space initiative plus 30 percent production towards all space program pro projects in the city um the space race takes a lot more production now in the uh gathering storm expansion we'll talk a little bit about that um in another video or maybe i go over victory conditions about what's required in them and how difficult they are and which ones i think are the most interesting and all that sort of stuff but basically this is going to be quite significant and you're going to get a lot of value out of this i definitely think though there is an argument to be made that liang's plus one build charge is better with the late game building that gives you the ability to invest build charges into spaceports to get extra production because the amount of production you get from investing build charges is based on the number of build charges that your worker has still pingala is still very very strong and if you don't have the finances to produce a builder every turn, you, you can always just park uh, Liang nearby and then walk builders over and feed them into the spaceport and get even more value. So I think that's that this is a really, 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 really interesting governor and really opens up a lot of strategies and he provides a lot of value. Now we're going to talk about Reina, who is possibly one of my other favorite new, uh, sort of, well, not new governors, but one of my favorite other governors. So, uh... <clears throat> The first ability here is acquire new tiles faster in the city. Uh, plus three gold per turn from each foreign trade route passing through the city. Uh, this is a basically an upgraded version of her previous one. Uh, the plus three gold per turn from each foreign trade route passing through the city is quite good. It means if you position her well, you can get a lot of money out of international trade or you know people internationally trading with you. Quite good. I don't know if it's... I mean, it... I'm not sure if she's worth a one drop aside from the loyalty, but certainly uh, worth investing into her later on. Harbor Master, double adjacency bonus from commercial hubs and harbors in this city. Uh, quite powerful. Being, uh, you can build, you can sort of gear a city towards uh, gold generation with Reina, which is something I really, really like about her. You could build a harbor and a commercial hub in, in a little triangle with the city center and get a lot of value from Harbor Master and tax collector which gives you plus two gold for each citizen in the city and coastal cities tend to have a good growth because of the ac easy access to food tiles and stuff like that um forestry management the city receives plus two gold from each unimproved feature title tiles adjacent to unimproved features receive plus one appeal in the city i think the appeal is kind of unimportant um although it is quite good for being able to uh generate a lot of tourism you could you could build a lot of national parks with reina around and just fill the city with forests and then fill it with na uh, national parks quite powerful um uh, because this plus two gold is d you don't need to work the feature you don't need to work the feature to get this plus two gold although i actually i could be wrong about that i haven't actually tested that damn why didn't i test that i was like oh yeah that's how that works but now i'm not sure um, but basically forestry management this is actually going to be a really really powerful ability in the early game 
Um, you can go two points into Reyna really quick to generate extra gold. Um, and then you can put a third point into her to get even more gold. So I definitely think Reyna is going to be a, a powerful governor here. The plus two gold from each unimproved feature, you know, this is sort of, you want to go for Reyna if you're not planning on chopping in a particular city. So this can be quite useful uh, to get the extra gold. And then you go for Tax Collector, which gives you even more gold. And then you can kind of finish up with the uh, Contractor promotion. I definitely think there's something to be said about getting all three of these and then getting Contractor or just going like sort of either either route to Contractor. I don't think Renewable Silver Civilizer is very good. We'll talk about that in a moment. So allowing the city to purchase districts with gold. The main ap application of this is still... Uh, buying spaceports, in my opinion. However, uh, I used this to great effect in a game playing as Mansa Musa, as alongside the um, the faith purchasing divine architect. And let me tell you, uh, being able to purchase districts with gold, and if you have a gold, good gold generation, it changes how you like. It changes the game, like in ways that I never really appreciated before Gathering Storm. I never really played around with Contractor, but I really wasn't giving this ability the credit that it deserves. Yes, it's really, really expensive to purchase districts with gold, but it's also really, really powerful to just instantaneously have a district and then be able to buy the buildings in it. Because you can you can literally settle a city, plop Reina in it, and five turns have like four like have like three fully built districts if you manage to grow the city in that in those turns. Well, probably probably more like two fully fully built districts, um, which is insane absolutely insane insanely powerful if you can get the gold generation to make use of it but otherwise she's just quite useful for generating gold uh we also have renewable subsidizer here i think this is easily her weakest ability uh all offshore wind farms solar farms wind farms geothermal plants hydroelectric dams in the city provide plus two power and plus two gold um so the big problem with this is that it's local power and generally speaking you're going to want to generate power in a sort of centralized way that's distributed to, throughout your empire it's not horrific. It's not a horrifically bad uh, ability. It's just in contrast to some of the other abilities that you could spend your governor titles on. It's really not doing a whole lot for you. So I definitely think Reyna is uh, quite good and you can invest in quite a bit to her. Now there is another governor in Rise and Fall that we're going to talk about briefly. I really don't have experience using Ibrahim. Um, so we'll... Uh, spent a little bit of time talking about him, but I don't have much experience using him and I'm not really sure how he works all that much. I did pick the Ottomans for this just so I could talk about Ibrahim, but he gets plus 20% production towards all military units in the city. This actually has interesting implications for multiplayer, uh, if, particularly team team games, because you could park Ibrahim in your friend's city um, and then, you know, he gets a production boost, which is really, really powerful. Um... Head Falconer, all friendly units fighting within the city gain plus five combat strength. Quite useful. Uh, now, friendly units, I think, applies to your allies' units as well. So this is quite useful for defending an ally. Again, in team games, this guy has a lot of applications and also in, you know, sort of just AI games and, and competitive games. Uh, grants all units within 10 tiles of the city center plus 10 combat strength when attacking defensible districts. Quite powerful in combination with um, the Ottomans' other ability that gives them extra combat strength on their siege units to districts, but make remember that this applies to all of their units. So this can be quite useful for doing a sort of Schitzkrieg or Blitzkrieg. Uh, I apologize. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> um, you, can, you, can, you can Blitzkrieg quite effectively with the Ottomans uh, with this Araskir promotion, because remember, that's 10 tiles. That's a really, 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 really long range. That could reach as far as two cities away from the city that he's established in. Quite, quite easily, actually. Um, since they can be settled three tiles, three tiles away and so on and so forth. Then there is the Kas Odabashi. Uh, when establishing an allied foreign capital, alliance leveling rate is increased with the owner. Quite powerful, quite useful. Alliance uh, Alliances also give you diplomatic favor, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the Ottomans are going to be able to leverage this extra alliance leveling rate to into more diplomatic favor because I'm pretty sure the level of the alliance that you have uh, dictates how much diplomatic favor you have. Sorry, how much diplomatic favor you generate. Then we have the Capuaga, which is when established in a foreign capital. Grievances from the city owner against you are reduced by one more per turn. This is quite useful if you have been going on a little bit of a warmonger spree and you need to cut down the grievance that a player has against you. I don't think it's super, super powerful. It's just more of a kind of cool mechanic thing that... I don't know if it really makes a huge difference. And then there's the Grand Vizier. Uh, when established in a foreign capital, none of the owner cities exert loyalty pressure to, on your cities. This can actually be quite powerful 
if there's some land near a player that you want to try and claim with some late mid to late game settlers which i think mid and late game settlers are better than they were in the base game and in rise and fall um you could s sort of settle uh, an enemy's coastline um you know without consequences i remember forward settling is quite useful for when you are trying to uh uh not only forward settle someone in the late game but also uh sorry forward cities are really really useful for providing loyalty but sort of this uh, this will negate the requirement but what you can do is for example on a continent's map uh you could send a settler with your army park the settler there because maybe you've unlocked some unit upgrades by the time you get there and you need some friendly territory that you can upgrade them in so you make your way all the way to the enemy's island plop down a city that doesn't have loyalty penalties upgrade all your units and then immediately attack him with plus 10 combat strength against all of his districts it's really really interesting it's really really powerful and really 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 fun fun to use i, I think uh ibrahim is really fun to use i i would like to I, uh, before i really give an opinion on him i'd like to actually use him but i think he's going to be a lot of fun to use okay so that covered like this is going to be a long video holy shit we're 45 minutes in all right so Uh, I tell you what, since this video is going to be so long, I'm going to hide a secret reward. Anyone who like, makes a really detailed timestamp uh, comment for this video uh, will get a free copy of Gathering Storm, okay? And all you got to do is make a really detailed timestamp where you timestamp every single thing, like when I start talking about Victor, when I start talking about Amani, Moksha, Magnus, Liang, Pingala, Reina, Ibrahim, and then when I start talking about general strategies here in a moment, and I'm hiding this in the middle of the video so that people don't notice. So the first person to do a really, really detailed uh, timestamp comment for me so that I don't have to do it will get a free copy of Gathering Storm. Okay? Uh... I kind of hid that one in there, didn't I? Anyway, we're going to talk about uh, general strategies. Uh, actually, you know, I kind of, I had kind of meant, meant to make general strategies as a separate section, but I kind of did general strategies when I was talking about the individual governors. So what we're going to do is talk about opening strategies, which has to do with your first uh, three to six um, governor titles. So I think the the general opening strategy that is still quite good is just putting one point into Magnus uh, and then one point into Liang and then one point into Bengala. And what this will allow you to do is be able to chop for a lot more value, be able to get builders for a lot more value, and then just be able to generate a little bit of extra science and culture in a city that you're not chopping or building builders in. So this is a really nice little opening combo. Uh, the other, some other opening combos, uh, refer, and this refers to the first, first three governor titles. So is either is going for um, Magnus, Amani, and Moksha. Again, being able to chop, being able to uh, get suzerainty, and then being able to use religious pressure. So that's kind of like the another opening strategy. Uh, um, uh, another opening strategy would be potentially going for um, Magnus into provision. So that you can chop out settlers without consequence and then um going magnus provision uh going like magnus liang provision in that sort of order so that you can build builders more efficiently in a city with liang and then use those builder charges to chop more efficiently out chop settlers out more efficiently so that's a that's a really good sort of three 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 drop combo that could be quite good as an opening strategy uh another opening strategy is Uh, we'll talk about all in, sort of all in on single things now, because I don't think, I think that kind of covers the, the general ones. Like, you can probably figure out some of these strategies yourself. So, another uh, kind of powerful opening strategy is to go all in with your first three governor titles on Amani and get the um, strategic resource generation. And then, with your next three, as a follow up, go all in to Black Marketer with Magnus. You can also go 1 1 and then 1 1 and 1 1. But I think, you know, I think it's quite good to go all the way down here quite early so it might be like one 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 two one two if you get me if you you invest those points and you'll be able to generate strategic resources that you don't have access to and then use those strategic resources efficiently to generate an army with magnus um another person who is if you have a really good harbor city uh sorry coastal city it can be worth it to put two points into liang early and then like just slap a point into pretty much uh any other governor that provides you with nice volume uh, i think the most powerful uh opening strategy is now the pingala opener and the reason i talk about this is because pingala circumvents a lot of the uh weaknesses of 
certain strategies that struggled. Um, basically, Pingala enables strategies that aren't just rush settlers. Because what you can do with Pingala is, for example, in the government plaza, there is a building that provides you with... Uh, where is it? Why can I never remember what this is? Ancestral Hall. The 50% production increase towards settlers. And what Pangala will allow you to do is you can kind of rush for state, you can kind of rush for state workforce, get out an early um, campus or holy site or something, right? Get out an early campus or holy site, rush for the two points in Pangala, uh, use his culture promotion to finish off uh, political philosophy. The, so what you can do is you go for a fast campus, okay, to get the science generation. Then you push two governor uh, while rushing for um, state workforce. You get the specialty district, right? And then you push for um, connoisseur with your first two governor titles. You get your third into researcher. Or something, or, or then you get your third into Magnus. Sorry. First governor title, second governor title, third governor title, Magnus. And what you can do then is you can more efficiently get to political philosophy, build the uh, ancestral hall, then plug in the plus 50% production towards settlers, and then super efficiently chop out settlers with Magnus, which are next to um, policy cards. So what Pingala actually enables, it might not seem like it, right? But what, what Pingala actually enables here is a delayed settling strategy where you can invest heavily into districts and tile improvements early and then not suffer for it like you would in the, other, in, in, in the base or rise and fall. So he actually enables this new strategy. And I would like to actually attempt that in a, in a game here. Because I, I, I kind of did it in one of my games. And it worked really, really well. But I'd like to really, really commit to it. Where maybe I get like one or two ec like early cities. And then power hard. But I, I think I'd like to do a sort of one city opener. Where I power hard for the Ancestral Hall. And then use Pingala to sort of make the timing on all of that hit a lot earlier and then i can crap out settlers with um with magnus chops i think that's going to be a really 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 interesting and powerful opener because it's just a different way of playing that currently doesn't exist in the game and there's a lot of other openers that pingala enables like you can just get extra so like being able to being have, having control of getting extra science and culture in the in the early game really opens up a lot of strategies for players so that's why i think pingala is currently one of the strongest and most interesting governors in the game so that's sort of the 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 few opening strategies that i wanted to talk about um there are other opening strategies uh, i'm sort of more concerned with follow-up strategies um, so you can kind of take any of those opening strategies and then use a follow-up strategy. A follow-up strategy might be, for example, uh, let's see, what would be a follow-up strategy? Let me have a look around here. I'm trying to remember what it is. So uh, good follow-up strategies are, I think Liang is, all, if you have a coastal city, it's always worth it to invest two points into Liang and then just park her in that coastal city and generate a lot of um, production food and builder charges. I also think uh, it's always worth it to invest at least three points into Pingala and park them in your biggest city. That's a good follow-up to pretty much any opening strategy that you do. And I also think it's worth it to invest uh, three points into Reina, get tax collector so that you have extra uh, gold generation. Whether or not you go for Harbour Master or Forestry Management is kind of up to the situation that you're in. If you have a second coastal city that doesn't have Liang in it, that doesn't need Liang in it, you can go for Harbour Master, build a commercial hub and a harbour in it and get tax collector. Or you can go for Forestry Management if you have a decent number of unimproved features and then go for tax collector. Uh... So I think those are sort of the general... I'd say, I'd say that kind of more or less covers all of my thoughts on governors that I have right now. I think in Gathering Storm, the variety of strategies available to the player are much larger than in Civilization Rise and Fall, uh, which I'm really, really happy about. I think I made references to the base game with regards to governors, but the base game didn't have governors. It, it feels like such an integral feature that you kind of forget it wasn't there. Um, but yeah, I think I think the most important takeaway here for anyone who is watching this video is that governors have a lot more strategies available to them. Governors have a lot more strategies available to them, and they have a lot more intrigue 
Um, there's, a, there's a lot more interesting paths you can take in the gameplay. Whereas previously it was like always invest one point into Magnus and make use of that. And then sometimes put one point into Liang, uh, Pingala or Moksha. Now there's li- like now there's very, very viable strategies for basically every governor um, with regards to how you want to go down their tree and what order you want to get them in and when you want to get them and all that sort of stuff. Really, really, really happy with the developers and the work that they've done on governors. I got to say, um, it, I think it's really going to open up the strategic depth of the game. Now, just just keep in mind, that's not like a review. That's just like a sort of sort, sort of my impression. This is just my impression of all the consequences of the changes to the governors. So I want to thank you guys very much for watching. That more or less covers all of my thoughts on governors. I know that took like an hour. I do apologize. I was hoping to actually keep this video down to half an hour, but no, I sat here talking like a like a <laughs> excited child on Christmas because of all the new goodies that we're getting in governors, which I am very, very happy with. So I will see you guys next time. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this series. Please remember to subscribe if you want to see more videos from me. Remember to leave a like if you want to directly support my channel. And remember to leave a comment if you want to give me your feedback. Other than that, I want to say I love you all very much. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.